What's up, War Stories fans? I want to talk to you about Auker Leather Duty Gear for a minute. When performance is your number one priority, we all know choosing the right gear for the job is crucial to your mission success. I used Auker Leather Duty Gear almost exclusively. If they made it, that's what I used. Ocker Leather Duty Gear gives you the confidence to perform at the highest level in the field, day in and day out. With over 40 years of experience crafting high-quality products for the law enforcement community, Ocker Leather specializes in making holsters, belts, and all the other accessories, and they stand the test of time. Let me tell you, I still have all my Ocker Duty Gear, and it is well-worn in, but still as nice as the day I got it. Major municipal and federal agencies from LAPD and Border Patrol trust Ocker to outfit their officers with duty gear that wears in and not out. And it's made in America since 1981, so that is awesome. Ocker is renowned for being the best name in leather, so visit OckerLeather.com and use the coupon code WARSTORIES for 10% off your order. That's Adam, King, Edward, Robert, Lincoln, Edward, Adam, Tom, Henry, Edward, Robert, dot com, and use coupon code WARSTORIES for 10% off your order. Warning, this podcast has stories of real-life events and true crime that happens every day. These stories may contain adult language and graphic or disturbing details not suitable for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. In our society, most people are content to go through their daily lives safely and peacefully. But our society is not always safe or peaceful. For that reason... Some men and women answer a higher calling to defend and protect their fellow man. You probably know someone who is one of these people, or maybe you are one of these people. The ones who see and do the things most people would never want to. These things are sometimes heroic and beautiful, but often they are horrific and terrifying. It's these things they don't share about with other people. It's these things they carry with them, so you don't have to. But when they get together, they talk to each other about them. And they call these stories War Stories. Welcome to another episode of War Stories. I'm Tom. And I am Chuck. And uh, we're just going to get to it. I'm pretty excited. We have very the great Joe Mantegna with us on this episode, Chuck. How about that? That's amazing. And for some of you who do not know, uh, he was in a major, a major, major uh, TV show uh, called Criminal Minds. Uh, and his role he played was David Rossi. Yeah. Special uh, special agent in charge, like the SSA yes. David Rossi, right? So, yeah. Mr. Mantegna, it is great to have you here. How are you, sir? My pleasure. Thank you very much. Great to be here. And uh, I, I know I reached out to you because of all the work you've done with uh, charities and stuff like that. And we'll for sure get to that, but you have been a big supporter of uh, men and women in uniform forever in a day. Is that about right? Well, I mean, you know, it's funny. I think back to even just being a little kid growing up in Chicago. I mean, and I grew up in the late, you know, I was born in the late forties. I mean, to me, my connection to men in uniform, like the police were like, the, the the beat cop, you know, I, I I have memories of being like seven years old playing down, down the street and, and all of a sudden feeling a little tap on the back of my head saying, hey, Joe, it's getting dark. You should be getting home. And I look up and it's the it's the, it's the neighborhood beat cop, you know, who everybody knew his name and he knew our names. Right. And that was it. And and that was like those those were wonderful times as I think about it. And I mean, I, I know obviously things change and, and cultures change and the world changes and it's hard to duplicate maybe, you know, times that. You know, you know, were what they were, but I mean, but from that point on, it made me understand even just that that connection of once. I, and of course, as you get older, and you understand what people do for a living and and what their what what their what their daily life is like. Uh, it just grew grew on that to, uh, to where I mean, it's funny you mentioned Criminal Minds. Some people know this, not everyone, but that character I played, David Rossi is named after an LAPD policeman, the former wow. LAPD who, who just wow. passed away about two years ago. But uh, I purposely named my character after him because, um, I mean, do I, I, just, I guess I'll just briefly tell you the background. It's, of that. it's your time. Tell us. Yeah. Uh, it was during the O.J. Simpson trial. 
During the O.J. Simpson trial, I was doing a movie up in um, Maine. And I remember, of course, everybody was glued to the television all during that thing. Right. Uh, but I remember that the first m- person to testify in the trial was the watch commander for the LAPD. And his name was David Ross. So I believe he was a sergeant. And and I remember him walking up to the to the to be, uh, you know, interrogated at the, the trial. And he was in dress blue uniform. And and he was very Italian looking, like like myself in a way, in the sense that he's people <laughs> like, like his name. He had the c- color of hair I have now, kind of w- white hair. So he was getting he was very close to retirement at the time. And I thought, wow, I said, oh, David Rossi must be an Italian guy, you know. And I just I thought, oh, this is interesting. The world was focused. Like, what is this guy going to say? He's the very first person to testify in that trial. Well, for three, something like three days, those defense attorneys kept him on the stand and beat him up. I mean, just kept beating him up. And, and then it became apparent, like, oh, I see. I get it. They're trying to blame this whole thing on the LAPD, like as if they right. did it, you know. And all I could tell you is I took offense to that for a couple of reasons. I mean, first of all, just like, well, wait a minute, this is not a, you know, but what has this got to do with two people that just got murdered? But second of all, he, this guy handled himself with such grace and poise and professionalism because everything was yes, sir, no, sir, yes, sir, no, sir. And he answered the questions and never lost his cool. And I said to myself, when it was over, I thought, you know what? I thought to myself, someday I'm going to name a, if I get the opportunity, I'm going to name a character after this guy, not just because of him, but because of what he represented of a guy that was being put in a position that is like, you know what I mean? This guy's getting close to retirement and he's getting beat up and he wasn't even there. All he did was answer the phones. You know, uh, he's the guy that sent the guy. Right. Right. Exactly. Yep. So jump cut to when I get, no, this is years later. This is something, whatever it is, 10, 15 years later, whatever it is. Now I'm I'm getting offered the show criminal minds and the, the producer of the show asks me, well, you know, we're bringing in you as a new character. Is there a name you want to pull B? And I, and I tell him the story. I said, yeah, how about David Rossi? I'd like to do that. He said, great. He, he was for, He's a former cop, the guy himself. Uh, Don Bell, uh, not Don Bell, sir. Um, um, I don't know, I'm space on his name. But he was uh, uh, Ed mm-hmm. Bernero. Ed Bernero okay. was a former Chicago policeman. And he was our showrunner for Criminal Minds. He, wow. created, you know, he didn't create the show, but he he uh, he was he was our, our main guy. He created... Um, um, Oh, God knows it's some other show. It was a police show that he created. But anyway, he was all for it. And I had never met David Rossi at that point. Didn't know who he was, nothing. I was just basing it on what I saw him sure. do in that trial. Well, David Rossi hears in an interview that Ed Bernero had done when somebody asked him, why was, you know, hey, Joe Montaigne, yes, he's in the cast. Uh, did, what, is there any history behind that name that, or anything why he chose David Rossi to play? And Ed tells the story in this interview. And somehow somebody read it in a, in a magazine and sent it to the real David Rossi. And he somehow contacted me through my agent or whatever and said, dear Mr. Montaigne, I, I don't know if this is true, but I've got, somebody sent me this article. And they say, you may have named your character after me. Is, is, is this true? And I wrote him back. I said, yeah, it's absolutely true. And I hope you don't mind, but uh, that's it. And if you'd like to meet me or whatever, if you ever get to L.A., because by now he's retired and living in Idaho. Well, he did. He contacted me, came to L.A. because his kids were living out here. And we were the best of friends from that point on. And I, we were very close from right up until, until the, when he passed away just uh, last year. And, but I, and, and to cl- and conclude that story, just to show you what kind of guy he was I, and, and what it meant, just talking about what we're talking about, the pride of people in uniform and the, the, what they have to go through. Right. I said to him, I said, Dave, I got to ask you. All the other cops that testified, everybody was in a suit and tie and whatever. But, 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 but you went up there in your dress blues. You were the first guy. You looked like you were a poster for the LAPD. I said, what was that about? And he said, yeah. He says, I, I, we knew all along. We knew from the beginning that they were, I was going to be the first one called and I would be the first one to testify. And he had been instructed or suggested by the higher ups. Maybe you should just get yourself a new suit and tie. We shouldn't put it in the people's face that were the police because there's going to be so much negative kind of thing anyway. And let's just try to offset that by just showing that we're just guys doing our job. And, you know, you tell your story. So, so he said he did that. He went out and bought a suit tie and he was getting dressed that morning. And as he was looking in the mirror, he said, Jesus Christ, I'm getting ready to retire. I've been a cop for 20 something years. 
I've got nothing to apologize for. I've done my best. I've tried to be be straight, tried to be do the right thing. What the hell am I doing? He said, I took it off. I put on my dress blues. I said, this is who I am. This is the face I'm going to put out there. and Take it or leave it. And I said, yes. Dave, that's why I named the character David <laughs> Rossi without even knowing that. That's and, uh, amazing. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's that story. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's stuff like that. I mean, you, you know, look, there's always going to be things going to happen in any line of work. There's going to be, whether it's the military, whether it's the police, whether it's the, whatever your job is, whether you're a garbage man, an actor, whatever it may be, there's going to be some problems. People that maybe cast a, 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 a bad light on everybody else because of their action. But that's got nothing to do with the mass majority and with the occupation itself. You know? Right, right. And, and and it's true. We talk about that, you know, one, one bad news story about a cop. My dad was a cop as well. And he used to say that one off shit can wipe out a thousand attaboys. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And and then think of this, think of what's the alternative. Let, let, yeah. Let's go 20, let's do 24 hours in a world without cops. Let's do 24 <laughs> hours with a world without, without military. Let's see what happens. The purge, yeah. the purge is going to happen. I mean, if that's the case, I mean, we'll be living in a in a movie, <laughs> right? We will be living in a movie a if they ever movie. did that. If we ever did that, it's oof. yeah, that'd be some scary stuff. Very yeah. serious stuff. I mean, you know, it's like it's like that whole thing of like it, it, it's like there, there, there's a line I remember. Uh, I was talking to a dear friend of mine, and, and somebody could ask him about um, uh, just you know. Uh, the need of stuff like that, it was like, you know, you know, about the getting into discussion about, you know, wow, do we really, do we need this much police and this, that, and the other? And his answer was, I think of it as like, you know, think of it like earthquake insurance. It's something you have and you hope in your life you never need. But if the moment comes that you do need it, you're probably going to need it really badly and nothing else will do. You yeah. know? And so yeah. when you're in that position, where all of a sudden that's the one thing that's going to make the difference between your life, your world, and not. And if it's not there, then what? You know, then the, who, who's who's to blame if you're the one that says, nah, I don't need that. That's, that's no good. Well, and, you know, the hard part for the, I think, civilians to understand is that if you're getting a cop who maybe is a little grumpy when he's writing you a ticket, um, like let's say a motor cop pulls you over for not wearing your seatbelt and he's writing you a ticket and he seems a little salty. You don't know that he didn't just come from an accident where a child went through the windshield because they weren't wearing their seatbelt. Mm -hmm. And he's writing you this ticket because he doesn't want that to happen to you as well. Right. Exactly. Right. And on the flip side, the cops need to remember, and this is again, I, my dad, I love my dad. He's a very smart man. He told me, he said, son, you're going to feel like everybody in the world is a dirt bag. But what you have to remember is as cops, we're usually only dealing with about 20% of the population. It's just that we're dealing with them 80% of the time. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it's, and it's a rough crowd very often you're dealing with, yeah. you yeah. know? Yeah. I mean, another example, when I did for, for, um, I did this movie called Homicide years ago. We shot it in Baltimore, David Mamet film. And I had to play a, a detective, uh, a homicide detective. And, right. and, and it also holds true even into when I did Criminal Minds for 13 years in the sense that I was playing a, you know, a supervisory special agent and we're dealing with some horrific stuff. But I remember we did research for the movie Homicide. William H. Macy, the actor, and I, we played partners in that movie. And uh, they set us up with two Baltimore homicide cops to kind of give wow. us a little, you know, well, let's right, give a little, guys Sure, yeah. a little training. A little training, a little background, a little... Uh, so they, I remember they, they showed up at the, at, at our production house, one of the early days of our, our get, just getting ready to start filming. And they brought these big books, which were like their, I guess their murder books or whatever you call them. Sure. And so, and yeah. they says, and they were great. And they said, they sat down with Bill and I, and they says, okay, you know, you guys are going to be playing homicide detectives. We're, we're going to give you a little pictorial kind of history of what kind of what our typical maybe year would be like. Oh, geez. I, I think up. they got the page three when Bill had to get up and said, you know what? I got a costume fitting. I'm, I'm going to have to leave. You know, Bill didn't have a costume fitting. He had to, he couldn't handle it. And I get right. it. But I thought, okay, we both get cut out. I said, I'm staying. I get it, fellas. Let's, let's go. Keep turning the pages. 
And, you know, and I, I witnessed some of the most horrific stuff that humans can do to other humans. Mm -hmm. yeah. These guys are looking at me and, and then, and then, you know, so we start talking about it and, and helping me understand why, oh, there's a percentage of guys in this profession that become alcoholics, a percentage of them that commit suicide, you know, sure. the, the marriages break up. I, I, you know, I get it. I get it. It's the same thing in, in criminal minds with people will say to me, they go, doesn't it bother you to do that show? It's so gruesome. It's so, you know, it's, it's what you have to deal with. Doesn't it make you nuts? And I said, absolutely not. I said, because to me, that would be disgraceful to the people who really do it for a living. I'm right. portraying a character and I'm going to try to portray it as best as I can to show you what they have to do. But who am I to say, oh, yeah, I go home at night and, and, and get freaky about it and, and take a drink because it freaked me out. Because when they say cut, that guy who's laying on the floor with an axe in his head, he takes the axe out and he gets up and gets a sandwich, you know, <laughs> right, it's, right. It's make believe. <laughs> but I'm thinking we're basing it on real stuff. What does the real guy have to deal with? What did you guys have to deal with? You know, when you when you had instances like that. So I'm just I'm the pretend guy. I'm 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 showing the public kind of what that world is like. But no, there's no way that that bothers me. It just bothers me that the real guys have the men and women have to do that job. And and so that's why you'll always have my respect. Now you you played or you. I guess, let me back up. Criminal Minds ran until just last year, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. the rumor is, I guess it was announced that there's like going to be a little revival? Well, they're working on it. You know, we, the show ran 15 years. I was on 13 of them. And, uh, and, 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 and you know, we left. We had a finale. But, but, but goodbye. We'll see you later. That type of thing. You know, but, but then they released, you know, basically all three. We had 325 episodes, which is a long run. It puts us in yeah. a rarefied air. So it went out on total syndication around the world. And as it turned out, I think even up to right now, we're, we're one of the top five shows in the world in syndication. In other words, in terms of the numbers. And even wow. I mean, just about a month ago, we were number one. So th this whole new audience has been kind of, especially among college kids, especially that, that age group. It's like we've got a huge influx of, of new viewers that never caught it the first time around because they were little kids and the parents probably didn't think that was the right show to be watching, you know, but uh, so the popularity has really been very strong. And so uh, Paramount plus uh, is, is that, which is now since we used to be on CBS and CBS is affiliated with Paramount plus they're, they're putting out, they put out the feelers of, Hey, you know, we're interested in maybe doing this again. How, how do you guys feel about it? And I think as a group, we, we feel, you know, I'm ready to go again. I, I uh, you know, we'll see. At least for it'll be a different format in a way. We'd probably only do maybe ten episodes in, in, a, in a chunk, but we would it would all be maybe one continual storyline and people yeah, one would be big able arc. To, yeah, it'd be an arc, and people would be able to get all episodes at once. If you wanted to binge watch them, you could probably do that. So it's a little different thing now. It's streaming versus yeah, like streaming. Netflix kind of style. changed the face of TV, really. Yeah, it really has, and I, I think that's the way it's going. I mean, I think networks, network TV is going to be mainly sports and news and things mm -hmm. live, things like that. Where it has it, to be live because the real drama will be on it because they, they, you, you don't you you. Uh, you don't have to pull any punches. You can actually right. stay and do things that you can't really do on the network. That that, and if you're talking about stuff that really can happen, uh, it's it's nice to have a little bigger dose of reality. I think. Yeah, it's so, it's good too. I mean, you can you you have all those episodes. You can watch them. You can binge watch them. You don't have to record them. They're there. You can watch them whenever you want. And I personally like it because I like to binge watch things. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A lot of people yeah. do. Yeah. So know, when you were getting in the gig and you started looking at playing your character dave rossi is you were a, a sergeant major in the marine corps dave rossi was a sergeant right. major in the marine corps uh -huh. right. and uh then joined the fbi and became part of the you know, basically a, a unit that's based on the behavioral science the actual bsu at the fbi john douglas and park deets and all those guys right and you were talking about doing those things for real you know you talk about john douglas and park deets and those guys. they were the guys that went and interviewed ted bundy and you know, had to basically make friends with him to find out what made him tick. Right. You know, that's, I mean, forget it. That'll, that'll drive you batty right there. Um, did you do anything special to prepare both as a character or an actor who's playing a Marine Sergeant major and then somebody who's a, an FBI profiler, an FBI agent? 
Well, I mean, along with, you know, like I say, that connection I had with the, with the police and how I feel about, the, you know, men and women in, in, in uniform in terms of law enforcement and, and FBI as well. I spent many times I went to Quantico, you know, did, did things there, uh, you know, research and, and, and also you know, the other show I do on the Outdoor Channel, Gun Stories. We did some episodes based on the FBI, so I was able to go for that. But I also had this connection with the military. Because this will be my, I, in fact, we just, Gary Sinise and I just taped our, our, our participation in it just Saturday, this past Saturday for the National Memorial Day concert. I've been doing the National Memorial Day concert for 20 years now. Yeah, I was going to bring that up. Yeah. And, and co-hosting it with Gary. Uh, I've been co- co-hosting it for 17 years and Gary's been doing it with me for the last 13 years. So that connection with the military has been very strong for me. And, and, and as it turned out, I got a very strong relationship with the Marine Corps. Because first of all, I had a few of my well, uncles were in the Marines during World War II, and then also I I was feted at the Eighth and I one year in Washington because of the stuff I guess do with the military, and and I got to know uh, Colonel uh, uh, General Three Star General Lieutenant General Willie Williams, who was uh, the, the commander of the base at that time at, at Eighth and I in D.C., which okay. is the oldest Marine base I think on the planet Earth, and. Uh, and, and and it was just it, it it felt right for me to like to when I realized I wanted the military to be represented somehow in some aspect on the show, the show because you know you hear enough stories about there'll be enough TV shows about oh yeah this crackpot who used to be in the army or in the air or whatever right, you know, right. a serial killer or something else. I said let's do the flip side you know let's let's make sure we we get I want to create a character that has that other background you know that his background was. Was, and, and then actually show it. And we were able to do, and I directed two of them, two of the episodes that there were flashbacks to my character's service in Vietnam and how he helped uh, his his um, his commanding officer who was a ho- homeless on the streets of L.A. And how that whole story, because that whole problem of homeless veterans. And we right, that was with Meshach Taylor, right? Meshach Taylor, my one of my dearest friends in the world. And he's the reason, he's the guy that told told me before I was even offered the job of Criminal Minds. He said, man, you got to catch this show. I love this show. It's my favorite show. And so once I got cast in Criminal Minds, I made it a point to, I said, I got to get Meshach a role in the show. And so it was just like perfect when we came up with the storyline of, and my assistant, Dan, uh, you know, co-wrote that initial episode of let's have him be my commanding officer, in Vietnam, he's homeless now, and that tied into the fact that I, I've been the representative for this group called New Directions, which is in you know out in Westwood here in L.A. And and what they do is they deal with homeless, drug addicted, alcohol addicted veterans. All you have to do is be a veteran, any sort of veteran. They take you in, and they run it you know like a military establishment, and they teach you a trade, clean you out, clean you up, and it's it's just a great organization. And I've been their spokesperson for quite a while now. So to, to be able to do all that and incorporate it on a TV show was a real gift, you know. And so that's why, and so I, that really opened up, you know, my, 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 my ability to kind of look into that more to the point where it was when I got my star, and I was fortunate enough about, I don't know how many years ago now, it's 10 years ago, maybe I got my star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame. You're allowed two people to speak on your behalf at the ceremony. You speak yourself, of course, but right. two other people speak at your behalf. I, the one person I had, speak was uh, the, the writer, director, David Mamet, who I've worked with very, very often, like I said, did the film Homicide I brought up earlier, mm-hmm. and very instrumental in my career, both in stage and film. But the second person I had speak on my behalf was General Willie Williams. He flew in from D.C. Oh, wow. And he got up on that. Wow. And here was on Hollywood Boulevard. It was 11 o'clock in the morning on whatever day that was. I think it was April something, mid-April something. And people told me later, they said, people were stopping traffic on the street because they're driving down Hollywood Boulevard and, and they see there's a ceremony going on and they see, <laughs> they see a three-star general with all the stars on his shoulders with the, in, in his full dress blues up there giving the speech. And the reason I chose him is because I wanted the military to be represented uh, to show that my life as an actor is one thing, but it's not so much that, because I wasn't ever in the military myself. And that's the right. p- reason why it's important for me to try to pay back somewhat. And so my feeling is, and I said it in my speech, and to paraphrase my speech that day, I said, you know what, I'm very fortunate to have this star on the Walk of Fame because they do that. They put the names of people on the ground here in Hollywood 
and people come by and say, oh, yeah, he, he, this is a guy. I used to see him in the movies or TV, and he, oh, he played these great parts. I said, well, there's another place in Washington, D.C., where they've got a wall, and that wall's got names on it, too. And I right. said, but mm-hmm. those names aren't guys that played parts of heroes. Those were guys that were heroes. And I said, yep. and I never, I never forget the difference between me who portrayed heroic figures whose names on a street and guys who are names are on that wall who are heroes. And that's mm-hmm. the difference. And that's why I never want people to forget that. And that's why I had Chuck Williams, you know, speak on my behalf. That's amazing. I mean, you picked a great branch too. Yeah, you go. <laughs> <laughs> and, hey, for my money, I'll well, say I mean, it out loud. I'll say it as many times as I need to. The U.S. Marine Corps dress blues are the best looking uniform in yeah, any military. That animal. might have something to do with it too. No, but I got to tell you, I, I love the <laughs> Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Coast Guard. You know, they're all. I, 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 I was the. I was the. Uh, the, the um for the U.S. Army Museum they just built in in Fort Belvoir, in, you know, near D.C. I was the spokesperson for that. So I mean, I got I got pretty tight with the Army as well. But right. uh, uh, but all the branches of service. I mean, I've equal respect and love for, for all of them. But but the, the Marine thing just kind of worked out that way, and and, and my connection to to, to you know, General Williams and and uh, uh, yeah, it's just it's just it's it's just, it's just been. I'm staring at the thing. Actually, I'm like it's. Where is it? No, if you spin this thing around, you can see up on the, up on the wall. You can see I've got that my. Oh wow! You can see 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 the, the, that's yeah. from the shadow of criminal. The next to it says the Marine Corps that was given to me uh, at Camp Pendleton when I uh, for the birthday one year. But anyway, that's wow. amazing. Those those Marines were very lucky for you, for you to show up at their uh, their Marine Corps birthday ball. No, are you yeah. kidding? That, that was a, that was a privilege for me. That, what a, what an honor that was. So, you know. Well, I I'm a bit of a film and theater nut and I can understand why you would pick David Mamet because I in doing my research and I wish I could have seen it. Uh you played one of my favorite characters in uh theater which is Ricky Roma. And if I'm not oh, mistaken, yeah, you won a Tony award. Yeah, that changed my life, that role. That's right. So it would make sense that you would have David Mamet speak when he wrote the play that changed your life. Exactly right. Yes, very instrumental in, in my life, as it turned out. Because, you know, I've been banging around for, you know... Yeah, I started working professionally in 1969. I did the play Hair. That's how I got started in this business. Did you do the nude scene? Uh, of course I did. <laughs> but, you know, the nude scene, there wasn't... A, you know, in retrospect, people think, oh, wow, there was a nude scene in that thing. It was very, it was nothing. I mean, it was a tablet. Yeah, it's... People yeah. stood up and you couldn't... They had lights flashing and it was, it was no big deal. I remember my mother came backstage after the show and said, oh, you look good. You got a nice body. Some of these kids are out of shape. <laughs> <laughs> had to go full <laughs> mom. Italian mother. Who was That's her, right. Her you look out. perfect, honey. <laughs> you look perfect. You look great. But, uh, but yeah, and so, you know, I, 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 you know, I had a great... Good time, but from 69 to 84, I was just basically doing theater, very little film work, hardly any, really, because I was more a theater guy. But it was David Mamet, who I'd worked with in Chicago on various little little projects, who called me and said, hey, I got this new play. We're taking it to Chicago. We might take it to Broadway if it goes well. Are you, are you in? I said, of course I'm in. You know, let's, let's go. And uh, I couldn't have written a better script. I mean, it was one of those things. We opened in Chicago, went on to New York. Uh, the show won the Pulitzer Prize. I won the Tony Award. Wow. And, uh, changed my life, you know, and it's been. Yeah, uh, if you've never seen it, either on stage or even the film is, you know, really. Yeah, the film's good. wonderful. Al Pacino and, played the role that I originated on Broadway. With, and, well, uh, and so as, <laughs> as soon as I saw you, it, it, your name attached to the Ricky Roma character, I couldn't help but wonder what that film would have been like with Joe Mantegna instead of Al Pacino. Well, and yeah, yeah, it's I'll not a knock know. on Al Pacino, but I, I really would have liked to have seen it. Well, you know, it, you know, Carol Channing, you know, created the Hello Dolly, and it was, you know, you guys aren't probably old enough to really. Oh yes, Carol Channing. Word. Carol Channing. <laughs> yeah, oh, but yes. Carol Channing oh. was like Hello Dolly. That's synonymous with her. If you're people from the theater, but sure, but, you know, Barbara Streisand did the movie. You know, and it's okay. I mean, because that that's what often happens. You can create the show on Broadway. And it's not necessary. And I get it because when I, the time they made the movie of Glenn Gary, my film career hadn't even really started. I was in fact still doing the play, but I'll tell you what, how, what a great guy David Mamet is. I was not, we had done the show on Broadway at this point for over a year. 
Uh, we're now touring it around the country. I'm doing it with Peter Falk at this time. He was playing the other role. Shelley. Columbo, one of my other favorite TV oh, cops. Yeah, and he, was, he became one of my dearest, closest. In fact, his star on Hollywood Walk of Fame, it's all of his story. His star on Walk of Fame is next to mine because I made sure he, he got it posthumously. He never bothered to follow through to get oh. it. So I made sure it happened after he died and I, and I had them put it next to mine. So our stars are next to each other on the Walk That's of awesome. Fame. That's awesome. Wow. But That's anyway, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, um, uh, no, 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 of course, lost my stuff the hell we were talking about. But uh, David Mamet and oh, 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 right, Mamet. The yeah. thing about Glengarry, I'm doing the play on, with Peter. We're on the road. We're in San Francisco, Boston, whatever. And now you have to understand, Al Pacino was offered the, the theater role before I was. They wanted to make it. I, ideally, the producers wanted to make it a star vehicle, like have Al Pacino do the play on Broadway. Mm-hmm. He was busy with something else at the time. It was a new play. I get it. He didn't do it. I got lucky that I, you know, I got the job you know if he would have said yes it would have been a whole different story if he'd have done the play but anyway mamet comes in my dressing room when we're on the road and he says he, he walks in my dressing room and he says i got news i got some news for you they just bought the rights to the, the movie rights to glenn gary glenn ross you're not doing it you know <laughs> so that's, <he's> very <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, Dave. I, all right, I get it. He goes, no, no. He says, I just want to let you know you're not doing it. Pacino's doing it. And I, which, of course, I understand. Well, of course, he's going to do it. Which is a wonderful surprise, but, but, but it's great. I get it. I would have cast him myself. He was a big star. I was still on the road, you know, still, I'd won the Tony, but that's all. I hadn't built up a career yet. Right. But he said, whereas to he, me, had, he had Godfather and Dog Day after. Yeah, he had everything. He had everything at that point, a bunch of stuff. But Mamet said to me, he went into his briefcase and he pulled out the script of the movie House of Games and he laid it on my dressing room table. He says, this movie, I won't make this movie without you. And then he had another movie, Things Change, that I wound up doing with Don Amici. And he said, I won't make that movie without you. And so I thought, what a what an incredibly honorable thing to, to say and do. And he absolutely followed through. So in other words, his feeling wow. was, I, I couldn't, you know, couldn't follow through and let, let you do the movie of you know, House of Game or uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, because, you know, producers want stars. And I get it. It was all stars. Jack Lemmon was in it, you know, Ed Harris, uh, whatever. But um, I made those other two movies. And, and uh, so he, talk about being an honorable man. So I, I, I have no regrets not having done that film. Would have been fun. I would, of course, I would love to have had the opportunity. But it's, it worked out just fine. It's interesting to know that you have this... Um affinity for you know people who serve in uniform and a a feeling of wanting to pay them back but it sounds like you also surround yourself with friends and you you have you count among your friends Sinise Mamet people that still value you know their word and their integrity and and loyalty and brotherhood and it sounds like that's something you've always surrounded yourself with I I think it's of the utmost important because at the end of the day that's all you've got you know what I mean? I mean, it's 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 who it's it's what you stand for. It's who you are. It's what you believe in. I mean, uh, that's why I'm, I, I, I've never really been political. Um, I don't support a, a political party. I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican. I've been an independent my whole life. And the reason I became an independent or, and stayed an independent is I want the freedom to be able to say, look, show me what you got, whoever you may be, whatever party affiliation you have, whatever position you you're you're running for if it's in politics let me see what what do you have to say let me see what you got and i'm not gonna because i'm not gonna commit myself to say oh yes i'm 100 percent on this side of the street which would negate everything else on the other side of the street and i can't do that because i find that there's too much crossover there are things that some things i can believe in oh and say yeah i support that and then i can say well you know what i also support what this these guys are saying and so i'm not going to break it down between like you know you know, there's a lot of gray area in between. I think there's a lot of us out there who feel that way. That like, you know, it's it's not all, this has to be 100% this or 100% that. We gotta, there's going to be some compromise on certain things. Yep. And, you know, that, that's what this nation is built on. We're a nation of, we're a melting pot. It's it's a collection of peoples. And right, we're supposed to be. Nationalities and everything. We got to, you know, we got to make it work. And I, I find it interesting because I think if most people were being honest, they would probably say the same thing, even though they may identify one way or the other. If you actually sit down and talk to people about their views, anybody with common sense, usually you meet somewhere in the middle and you're like, yeah, okay. I I agree with you there. I may disagree with you there, but you know, 80% of the subjects we're talking about, we're pretty much, we can come and, 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 but 
as soon as you get to that actual political level, then all that goes out the window because you're paid exactly. to be adversaries. So yeah, I, yeah. I, I hate admin, and, you know, police admin is political, fire department admins political, and to some extent, the military admins political. So <laughs> you just, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you might politics. Feel, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, for, for me, so you, the national spokesperson for the U S army museum. And yeah. I'll, I'll now go on record and say that uh, for my money, the pinks and greens, the world war two uniform that the army just brought back is the second best looking uniform yeah. in the history of any military. Ever. I like they went to the berets too. That was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just love all of the, I mean, I, 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 let's be, let's be honest. I saw a top gun one too many times growing up. And almost joined the Navy until I realized they wouldn't guarantee that, you know, recruiters are liars and they couldn't actually guarantee me a spot at flight school. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? Yeah. I, you know, it's very similar for me. I tried to join the Marine Corps at 19. Uh, you know, I was living in, uh, I, was, I was in junior college. I think I'd just broken up with the current girlfriend. And I was like, oh, what the hell? I, I need I need a break. I need to get away and do something. And so I just thought that's, and, and I would always wanted to, at that time, I wanted to be, a, I had in my head, I wanted to be a pilot. You know, of course, right. every 19 year old did. And I thought, I'll just, you know, and, and the Marine Corps had a uh, program at the time. Uh, and I'm sure it was an inducement to recruit people. They said they had a thing out there saying, you come in, because you got to remember the Vietnam War was going on at the time, which was, you know, me, I wasn't even, I knew I was aware of it, but I really wasn't that, like, you know, that they were. We it was a thing, but it wasn't right. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't real. It was just, it existed on TV. And I kept thinking, nah, if I'm a pilot, I don't like, you know, that, that's, that's not going to affect me. So I, they had a thing that if you try, you joined the Marine Corps and you picked what, uh, you know, what, what, what kind of occupation within that service you wanted to do. If for any reason you didn't qualify, you can, you, you weren't committed to stay in the Corps. You just have to drop back into the draft. And then, and then you, it's like, then the army can take you, you know, it's, it's up to them. <laughs> right. You know, right. They'll take everybody, you know, so. So I thought that's cool. All right, but I'm going to go. I'm going to go do this. So I went in and I and I and I and I did all the stuff you do. And I took the physical, and it was in the physical that I get to the eye exam, and all of a sudden I'm realizing I'm squinting. I'm doing this and that. And, and then the guys tell me they go, "Well, you do you, you wear glasses?" I go, "No." I go, "I, I go, I do." But and I, and I realized in junior college I'd always try to sit in more in the front rows because I was having problems seeing the blackboard. They said, well, you know, to be a pilot, you have to have 2020 or better non-correctable vision, at least back in, this is 19, I'm talking 1967. This, yeah. I'm, I'm and they said, no, you, there's no way with your vision. As it turned out, I had 2200 vision. Yeah, uh, they said, you're, yeah, that's nowhere near 2020. No, apparently. They said, please go see a eye doctor <laughs> when you leave here, first off. <laughs> And second of all, they said, no, you, you're not going to make it to flight school. But they said, what we can do, we can take you into the Marines. And they says, you know, th we can get you like, they've got these guys that like load the bombs on the planes, on the ships. And, you know what I mean? They were, they, they were, they weren't exactly painting the, <laughs> the picture I was imagining <laughs> right. myself doing. And I said, you know, you know, uh, no, nah, you know what? That's okay. It wasn't meant to be. I'll just fall into the draft and let's see what happens. And as, of course, as it turned out, I had, they had the lottery. I had a very high number, never got chosen, never thought twice about it. And it wasn't until, like I said, years later, when it kind of hit me in the face about, you know what? And the first time I went to D.C. after the wall came up and saw, I thought, wow, you know, just because of a birth date, maybe fell on this day instead of that day, I wasn't. Of, you know, in, in Asia when I could have been, and I, maybe my name would be on that wall. So you're talking about luck of the draw. You know, what about that guy? You know, his, you know, he had no control over his birthday, but now he's on that wall. It's a sobering that's, experience. That's what that's all about, you know, and, that, and that's why to this day I feel, and Gary and I talk about, because Gary Sinise is the same way. Neither of, neither of us served, but we had a lot of family members who did. And, mm -hmm. and we feel like, you know what, just through the circumstances, we didn't get that call. But, you know, we owe something. We owe a debt. And, and, and this is my way, at least trying to, pay, in a small way, pay, repaying it. Well, it is an amazing way to repay it. I, Chuck and I have talked about this, and, and it's been said on this podcast before, you know, because guys will say, oh, I love your show. I, I'm a cop or in a rural area, but I don't have any crazy stories like you guys have. Or, you know, somebody will say, I, I was in the military, but I never got deployed. Or somebody will say, you know, oh, I wanted to join the military, but I, I, I felt like I should, but I never did it. You know, there are 
all these regrets that people have for not serving. Like for me, I, I can honestly say if I had it to do over again, I probably would go into the military regardless. I would have signed the paperwork and just gone into the military. But um, the the peacetime Marines, you know, the, the guys that we, we, we joke around about Clinton's military, you know, they never went anywhere for the better part of eight years. But they they have this feeling of guilt or like, like they're less, you know, than a veteran who deployed. And we always tell them just by signing up, just by putting on that uniform, just by going to basic. Absolutely. You've already done more than most anyone will ever do in their entire life. It, it's the, and it's the educational aspect of it. See, I'm a huge proponent of mandatory service. You know, oh, I, me too. I talk to guys in Washington about it. And, and, and I'm not saying everybody's got to be a combat you know, soldier or Marine or whatever I'm saying is, I, you know, so many people, I, I was one of them. When you come out of high school, you're, you're half a knucklehead. You're like, you've been, you've been in school since kindergarten. And not the good half. And yeah, <laughs> and you've done, you've done all the schooling. You went through high school and maybe, you, and, and so you finish high school, you've been in school, all, you know, 12, 13 years of your life. Maybe it's, that's a good time to just say, you know what, for the next year or two, let's devote it to whether it's the military, the Peace Corps, you know, something you're going to be given back to, 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 to you know, the nation you happen to be living in, in our case, the United States. Right. And, 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 and that's the formative year in your life. That's what you, you need the discipline of like what it's like to, you know, that's what kills me when you see the, the Easter break and a spring break and you see all those freshman college kids all in Miami getting drunk and throwing right. up. And I'm thinking, oh man, you know, and they wonder why they have hazing in the fraternities and this, I said, I said, yeah, it's all great and stuff, but if you preface that with maybe a couple of years of them having to, you know, let's say be in the Marine Corps, the Army, the Navy, the Peace Corps, whatever it may be, working in, you know, in, in, in a nursing situation or whatever it may be, some Serving. sort of public service, they're going to come out of that so much better and so, with so much more focus and, and then be able to say, now I know what my, if I'm going to go on to further education, now I'll go to college. And I think I'll skip this, you know. I don't need to do all the partying and carousing and this, that, and the other. You'll do it, of course, to an extent, but you're so much more matured and you're educated and you're, you've, you, you've, you've had this growth as a human being. And that this, that's why, you, you know, better or worse, you look at a country like Israel who has that kind of thing where everybody, you know, everybody's kind of served at a certain age and they got to yeah. go into it. If Two nothing years. else, regardless of the politics, you're talking about a country that, you know, is no bullshit. They're not going to, you know, they're not going to, they're not going to go down easy because. And they're single, unified. Yeah, because everybody's got that same, they can walk down the street and you see somebody your age and you know, regardless of what their station in life is, at one time, we both had to go do this thing. You know what I mean? Yep. That's, to me, that's the important thing of mandatory yeah. service. There's a connection. You know, you yeah, and I street. agree with you. Yeah. I, I, I think that uh, it doesn't have to be the military. No. How about Habitat for Humanity? How about, exactly. the, like Whatever. you said, the Peace Corps? I, I, I'm in favor of a list, right? We just have this list. Right. And it says, you know, these are the eligible service groups, the the five branches of the military, plus, you know, whatever other, you know, uh, civilian service groups. You pick one of them. You got to do two years minimum. Right. right. And if you don't, you're not eligible right. for federal federal student aid. You're not eligible right. for you just you're just not. And if yeah. you don't do it, you're not going to go to jail, but you also won't get any of the benefits. Right. And you. Yeah. But if you join the military, right. you get free <laughs> well, college. Yeah. Right. No, and it's great. And, and, and it's just, it's just, it would solve a lot of problems. First of all, you would put people shoulder to shoulder with people that in their normal life would never have been able to run into. You got rich people with the poor people. You yes. got blacks with whites. You got Jews with Catholics. You got this, that. You're mixing up everybody, just what this nation is. And during those two years, you know, as you know, as a former Marine, I mean, you're talking about, you know, when you're, when you're out doing mm -hmm. a, a, in deployment, you're not wondering what the guy next to you, what his background was. All you know is he's, you've got his back and he's got yours and you're not that concerned uh, of what color his skin is or what his nationality is or what his no, everybody's green. Is. You know what totally. I mean? You're all exactly. So, I mean, it's that too. And, and it would solve just so many problems, I think, in this, in this country, but Absolutely. I mean, you get to know so many people in and out. I mean, one of my really good friends, best friends that I still speak to today is a, is a black man. I mean, and, and that guy is amazing. I mean, we have shared some close confined spaces with one another. We've showered with each other. We've done absolutely everything together. And that is what really opened my eyes. I mean, you know, 
I, I don't give a shit what your race is, what color is, what your nationality is, what your religion is. You're a good person. Sure. You're a good person. You have my back. I have That's yours. Right. That's it. I mean, it was it was an amazing bond that we had. We still have that bond to this day. Uh, I have another, you know, another friend who's who's a Cuban guy. I mean, it, it didn't matter. I we didn't have any clicks of race or anything. It's just you you enter in the military from day one. That's right. You're all brothers. That's and right. That's, that's right. how well, it goes. Just, on. All you need, we need to do as a country is expand upon that. You know, not that everybody has to be a marine, but everybody has to be part of that. Whatever it may be, the Marines are part of it. The Army, the Navy, the Peace Corps, the human, you know, absolutely Habitat for Humanity. Like you say, whatever it may be, we are we are all part of the whole, you know. And we just got to pick, you know, pick your spot, and then uh, in one generation, you could change, you could change the face of the entire country. You know? Oh, hundred percent. Because and and here's I think another 100%. key to that. Uh, yes, obviously, you know, you get some kid who grew up in rural South Dakota and has maybe seen one black person his entire life, and he doesn't believe the systemic racism is a thing, right? Because he's never had a had to experience anything that looks like racism. But you take those experiences and you, you contrast them with a young man who grows up in, in Watts. And the only time he sees white folks is when they're driving through with their windows rolled up or in a police car, you know, those are two very different experiences. But then when you take those two people, you put them together in an environment where number one, it doesn't matter where they came from, right? It doesn't matter where you came from. You are, you all come into us equally blank slates. You will prove yourself or you will fail on your own merit, I don't care where you're from. That's the first thing. But I think the second component, which is super important, is like you said, the service. Step outside your own bullshit. Step outside your own self. Go and actually do something for somebody else. And you know what's amazing? You'll find that your petty crap that you think you know is so important in your life, when you build a house for somebody who doesn't have one, or when you stand... Perfect on a, a, a skirmish line defending somebody from violence that, that asked for no violence whatsoever. You know, when you do that, I, I remember I worked a riot it was a stupid college riot. Like of all things, it's a college town, college riot. These kids just lost their damn minds for Mardi Gras. And there was some girl there. She cute little blonde thing, probably 18, 19 years old. She had gone to this college town for the weekend and she was partying and the riot kicked off and she was stuck in the middle of it. And I'm wearing, you know, my hat and my bat, you know, riot, full riot gear. And we're swinging into the crowd trying to take, you know, people who are throwing rocks and bottles. And all of a sudden I see this 19 year old blonde girl huddled in a corner crying on her cell phone to her dad that she doesn't know how to get out. And she doesn't know. And I just scooped her up and I pulled her behind the skirmish. And you know, when you serve somebody else outside of yourself, you realize there's none of your bullshit matters. What matters is what you can do for other people. That's what will make you feel good. That's what will give you a positive experience in life. It's not being selfish. It's being selfless. That's right. Absolutely right. Mm-hmm. Right on. So I, I beat that drum all the time on this show. But now I, real quick, because I, I know I would get fired by uh, my wife. <laughs> Number one, if I didn't tell you that for my money, my favorite Joe Mantegna role, criminal minds aside, is Art Shirk. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> money fit. Yeah. Art Shirk. Yeah. Good looking role. Yeah. That was. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I wasn't even going to ask, but you said it. So I, yeah, well, I'm that a was, happy man. I remember it was online a few years ago. They, they said they, they, they picked. Somebody, they had a contest, which they thought were the, 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 like 50 most famous quotes in the movies of all time. And, and for some reason, you know, good looking wolf, that line I did made the list. I mean, when I, I did like <laughs> thousands of people, but anyway, yeah, I mean, that was a, that was a fun experience. You know, Tom Hanks, what's funny is I'd worked with Tom prior to that when he had done his show, Bosom Buddies. The sitcom, right. And I did, I had done a guest shot on that years before. So we knew each other. And so to be able to do that movie with him was, was a lot of fun. And, uh, and, uh, it's funny though, when you, when you said when you brought, I, I thought you were going to say fat Tony because boy, I get that so much because that's my longest running role. I've been doing sure, I know years that. on the Simpsons. Uh, but that's a big one. I know that's true. Money pit, uh, uh, art shirk, uh, that, and, uh, you know, yeah, that, that's, that's one of the uh, more popular that and, and the, and, uh, uh, Ian the shark from uh, Airheads. Airheads. Yeah, I was going to mention that one. I loved that one. Cross section <laughs> of the public really 
cues in on that movie a lot, you know. Okay. I'll give you I'll give you another one. I loved you as the head of the studio in Three Amigos. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Take the amigos clothes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. That yeah, that was a lot of fun on that one too. That was that was great. Well, yeah. you were working with some of the he- biggest names in comedy Flugelman, in one room. Yeah. Flugelman, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And actually, that's when I first kind of I experimented with the voice that ultimately became Fat Tony. Because when I did Flugelman, I kind of talked like this as, as Flugelman. And then I realized <laughs> when I wound up finally doing Fat Tony some years uh, later, I, I kind of tapped into that voice again. And, and they didn't say stop it. So I kind of did it at the first time we recorded the, the first episode that I did. And I've been doing it ever since. It was an it's homage right. to my uncle Willie, that's the one who fought under through Patton's army. That he, you know, he actually he talked like this, and so that's why I got that voice. So, uh, uh, oh, Patton's third wow. was he in the battle? Yeah, yeah, he was. He and he, he, he actually, uh, yeah, he, he 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 went through the whole thing. He went through, uh, you know, um, Bastone, Bastone, and then he was wounded, uh, wound up in a hospital in Paris. And then they wanted to put him in a repo unit, you know, and he, 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 he couldn't, he said, no, it's not going to happen. And they contacted his, his sergeant, drove up in a Jeep and they, they bailed him out of the hospital. That's where he, he left his, his, his purple heart to, he used to pin <laughs> on it his to pillow. pillow. <laughs> he left yeah. the pin to, to the pillow wow. and he went back to his unit. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, so he, he was, uh, he did the whole thing. I mean, he went through Belgium, France, Italy, Germany, you know, walked up through. Uh, That's, that's yeah. He, or no, oh, that's he was hardcore. Yeah, hardcore. That's amazing. And his, I'm, and his three brothers, uh, all four brothers, were all World War II and all overseas. My uh, my my wife's great wow. grandfather uh, was on Starvation Island. He was a Marine in, at Guadalcanal. And, uh, you know, it, what's funny is because I've, I've always been fascinated with military history and stuff. He had, you know, my wife's grandfather was his son, obviously, and grew up with him. And my my wife's father was, you know, grandson, all this stuff. They couldn't get anything out of this man right he was just you know it was like he didn't talk about it he right. drank drank for many years after the war and right. and then when mm-hmm. he quit drinking he quit talking and i remember when i started dating my wife and i started meeting her her uh great grandfather uh bob robert c milburn uh of the united states marine corps i sat down with him and i was a cop and i started kind of talking to him and i guess that's when i first realized that the experiences are very similar because when i he's oh so you're a police officer yeah thanks you for your service and all this and i'm like no 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 thank you he's like no 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 you you know it's a whole different war zone for you and blah 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 and he started talking to me and then he started telling me stories about his time on starvation island in guadalcanal and how oh. they would do these when the army finally showed up they'd raid the army camps to get food and socks and all the things that they'd been out of for weeks and, you know, I remember my wife, you know, looking at me and going, you know, he never talks like that to anybody. Yeah. He really respects you and he likes That's, you. Yeah. And I That's realized we may not be on the same team. And this is the motto of the show. Not the same team, but we're all the same side. Exactly right. No, absolutely right. No. In fact, I want to show you. This, this was on my desk at Criminal Minds the whole time. This, this, is, this is my Uncle Sam. That's my dad's brother. Wait, can I can I take a picture of that for our yeah, uh, social media and post? Okay, absolutely. This is awesome. That's. I gotta say, I, the, this whole time yeah. I've been staring at that. And is that an e, is that an EGA up next to the the Michigan M? Uh, that's uh, yes. Is this for me? Is this? I got this. This is my little thing for the Marines. Wow, oh, you yeah. have a lot of Marine Corps yeah, stuff. That's the, amazing. Look at that, you know, at the hat. You can see the hat there. Yeah, I've been, <laughs> I've been staring yeah, at all your Marine Corps yeah. memorabilia. Chuck's a big time Marine, obviously. Share, but, but this guy, he was he was at Pearl Harbor. He was on the USS Chicago, wow. and uh, and uh, oh. he, he he was hospitalized, made it out. It was my dad's brother from uh, Chicago on the Chicago. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. That was cool. <laughs> and uh, uh, so that 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 sat on my desk all those years of Criminal Minds, you know. And along with it was we they had made up then a picture of, of me in Vietnam with my 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 squad and all that. But um, it was kind of like my homage to my family, just having it there. A lot of people look yeah. at it. Oh, was it that supposed to be your dad? And people because he does. We we looked a lot alike, my uncle and I. So so that was. Nice. He go sure, why not? But it's yeah. my uncle. <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> my, my tribute to him. So uh, wow. you produce gun stories and Hollywood weapons, right? Mm-hmm. 
And uh, those are two great shows for our audience who, you know, if you don't, I mean, for my money, watching my friend Larry uh, verbally spar with Terry Shepard, who oh, they've yeah. both been on this show twice. They're great. Yeah, they're they're like right now. Abbott they're and Costello. Today, yeah. Oh, God. Like they're 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 Abbott and Costello for the gun world. It's it's awesome. Yeah. Um, and I love the the myths they 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 choose to. Well, not even myths. the the movie scenes. They try to test, you know, uh Oh it's, yeah, they've great. come up with some great stuff, and they've really, especially over the years now, the, the, the camaraderie between like Larry and Terry, and uh, and then they've added other comic kind of relief kind of stuff to it. It's it's it's, it's just great. My assistant Dan, who really thought up the show, he created the show, Dan Ram, and uh, he, he was I, I gave him a couple of weeks off just because they're they're in the middle of filming right now. One of the things he had to do is he built this catapult. I mean, it's he built a full size goddamn catapult. <laughs> This thing can throw like a bowling ball, That's awesome. like a hundred yards. I mean, and he just went online. You have to go online. How do you build a catapult? I mean, <laughs> Dan is handy enough to do that, but no but way. Anyway, yeah, that, that's a, that's a fun show. And then gun stories I've been doing for ten years now, and that's been a lot of a lot of fun. So you're just you know you're heavily involved in uh, you know obviously men and women in uniform. You've been involved with the LAPD Memorial Foundation, but uh, one of the things that I th- found was interesting is that you're not afraid to to like you were saying, you're you you're in the middle. Um, you're all are part of Homeboy Industries, which helps people get out of gang life and actually find like meaningful work and and a place in society and not and not just be run around on the streets creating problems sure. for cops. Which, as far as I'm concerned, that's a police charity as well because you're helping do the Lord's work to prevent you know no, cops from having to arrest these poor kids absolutely that's what i mean it's not you know it's not all a black and white world i mean it's all there's going to be some things that are just going to the stuff's going to meet in the middle and they're going to mix and you're going to realize you know what there's there's you, you got to be flexible and you got to do whatever it takes to, 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 to that's how you, that's what harmon you know the word harmony means you're harmonizing you got some right right so the high voice going with the low voice and you put it together and it sounds really nice but sometimes that's what life is like too you kind of be kind of be flexible and you, 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 but at the end of the day, you try to do what's right and just try to be, you know, you try to be kind to each other. And, and if you go in with that attitude and try to find that middle ground where you can, everybody kind of be comfortable, you know, and maybe. Well, I would, I would say you're doing a lot more than just a little, right. I mean, you're doing a, a lot of amazing things. You're working with the military. Um, you're, you're doing, you know, the charity that you spoke of before with, with uh, the vets that, you know, have. Uh, yeah. What was that charity again? So maybe our, cause with. some of our listeners might be interested in if new, directions. Can... new directions, new directions for veterans are located in, in, in Westwood. They're in a building that was, actually dates back to God, oh, the late 1800s. And it's a, it's, it's a wonderful organization. Like I said, they just, t- they take you in, no questions asked long, as long as you're a vet. And if you've got substance abuse problems or whatever it may be, it, and you have to work your way up. You start out like you're in a room with like eight guys and on bunks and stuff like that. And there's some guys that have been in there for a few years and they work their whips. A lot, some of them stay and become part of the staff and and they teach you trades. And it's, wow. it's, it's a wonderful organization. I had a friend. Do you know what's did, interesting? Yeah. It, what's interesting about the way that wow. sounds is it's very structured. And let me tell you, there's a lot of guys that fall apart after they leave the military because they lose right. the structure. Exactly. And they they mm-hmm. they didn't. For whatever reason, they weren't able to continue it in their civilian life. And maybe an organization that has that structure. Let's face it. If you're in the military and you're getting get say, separated from the military or you're retiring from the military, there is a place where some veterans end up that has structure called prison. And that's the, that's the wrong route. I mean, I can tell you one of my closest friends, you know, I was a cop. I went that route and he went in the Navy. And then after the Navy, he went to prison because he made a stupid mistake right oh. after he got out. And you know, now he's, he's, he's got his life turned around. He's married, you know, all that great stuff, but he's got 20 years between getting out of prison and now, but that's, that's not the route you want to go for structure. Why don't you go the route Joe's talking about where, where you find the structure, learn the skills and and get your life together. So we, we certainly think that's an amazing thing. And then you are the national Memorial day. You said you uh, recorded the concert and the parade, uh, well, we didn't do, the, not yeah, the parade, we, we didn't do the parade this year, but Gary and I normally were there live. You know, for, like I said, it's my 20th sure. year. Normally we're there on the West Lawn of the Capitol. We get a live audience of people in front of us, 200,000 people when when we normally do it. 
I mean, it's just an awesome experience. There's a Capitol buildings right there, the flags flying. There's 200,000 people were on the stage with the Washington Symphony Orchestra behind us. We have musical talent. This, that. But, the, but the emotional stuff is when we do these live readings of, of people, you know, telling the stories. The letters, yeah. You know, but so this year we had to do it virtually again. We, we hope to be back in D.C. next year. I'm sure we will. But this year we had to do it virtually. But, but they did a wonderful job. We did some green screen stuff, Gary and I, that really was very effective. And then we shot uh, segments with a wonderful actress, Kathy Baker, who I worked with in the past. I got her to do, I, I'm, I somewhat co-produced that show and, I, and I'm involved in acquiring some of the talent. So I got Kathy Baker to, to do the role, not the role, she actually relives, recounts the words of this woman, Diane. I can't, I can't think of Diane's last name. But this is the woman who during the Vietnam War, she was a nurse, one of the like 9,000 nurses who were over there. A lot of people don't realize. Right. Hard women Combat nurses. Oh. That conflict. And she came back with basically PTSD and was a wreck. And she, what turned her around was she was going to visit the Vietnam Wall Memorial. And some vet came up to her. And she was basically had been suffering with this PTSD because of what she had been witnessed and what she had to deal with during those time in, in, overseas. And this guy said to her, he says, were you a nurse? Because maybe she had a pin on or something. She said, yeah. And he hugged her and says, you saved my life. You saved the lives of my, 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 my. And this guy broke down and it caused her for the first time to just totally break down. Right. And because of that, she is the one who was behind creating the woman's the one. It's in D.C. now, that statue, that's, that's the woman's in the military memorial. So she, was, awesome. she, was, she spearheaded that. So Kathy Baker gets to tell her wow. story on this year's concert, which will it'll be on PBS on the 30th, uh, May 30th, the Sunday before Memorial Day. And it's just, uh, you know, we've got Gladys Knight and the Pips, the Four Tops uh, are going to be performing. Um, Joe Morton is one of the people who does some of the readings. It's 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 going to be a great show. And so, the, and, and I look forward to it every year. And I always say it's the most important thing I do every year because it really is, because it's really about something. And, and we, I get a lot of emails, the show's over from from, from you know people who it's been helpful to them you know so that's yeah. awesome and and as we approach memorial day i want to remind our listeners first of all it's not veterans day right so don't right. go up to a I've veteran oh, and don't go up to a veteran day. on memorial day and say thank you for your service because they're still alive <laughs> right right so let's just get that out of the way right. uh two you know when you're barbecuing with your family Right. Because let's face it, a lot of people, that's what I'm going to be doing on Memorial Day. I'm going to be barbecuing with my family. And the reason you can barbecue with your family on Memorial Day is the reason you do barbecue. Exactly. On Memorial Day. Exactly. Because the men and women of this country, just like you, just like me, the sons, the daughters, the fathers, the brothers, the uncles, the aunts, the cousins, the sisters, they signed up and went somewhere that you couldn't even imagine and paid the ultimate sacrifice. For those hot dogs and hamburgers and, and, Absolutely. and fresh That's air. Exactly so. right. I mean, it was way after I did the first concert when I came to that realization because I felt just like you. I mean, Memorial Day, all my family, a lot of them have been in the military, but they all came home and they didn't, like you said, they didn't talk about it. So it was like Memorial Day was, you know, the Indianapolis 500 and barbecues and, you know, I get it, and other families who had to, you know, mourn their losses of, you know, family in the military. But after I did that first concert, what it spun it 180 degrees for me to where it was like, just kind of paraphrase what you're saying. To me, Memorial Day is the most important holiday we have in this country because without yep. it, there's no other holiday. You know, if, you, if you're not going to right. on Memorial Day, there is no yep. Fourth of July. There is no yep. President's Day. There is no Labor Day. You know, we wouldn't have those right. holidays without the sacrifices made that we honor these men and women for Memorial Day. That's the most important holiday. And, you know, it, it's... You know, people don't think of it that way. But if you stop and think about it, that's the one that should get your attention. And we're not saying you got to walk around and be, you know, wearing a flag shirt all day no. and, and go to the cemeteries if you, if you or whatever. That's not what you do. But just pause for a minute and just think about that. And that's why we do that show for 90 minutes. We do a program on PBS. You watch the show and it'll teach you nothing else. It'll show you this is where we have a more effect. You know, I was talking to my wife, uh, my soon-to-be wife, um, about Memorial Day, and I said the same thing. I said, I wish people would stop thanking me for Veterans Day. Like, it's it's not Veterans Day. Uh, it's the day that I remember some of my buddies who, who are not here anymore. It's the day that, that, you know, we can have because they died for for this. They they were They were here. They fought for it. 
and that's the reason why we were able to have it. And I was like, I wish just, I wish they could just go to the cemetery, drop, drop one rose on some random grave. Cause that that's might right. meet the world to some family member that feels like they may have forgotten about him. I mean, it's, it's tough because it, it's, it's, it's a tough day. I mean, I, I'll probably barbecue. I'll have a couple of drinks. Uh, me and the rest of my buddies may, may remember, uh, or going to remember those that aren't that's here. That's good. You're that, honoring them by doing that. True heroes. Yeah, because they, they, they'd want to. Because it shows that they that, that their yeah. sacrifice wasn't was worth it. In other words, yes. you know what I mean. They would want you to be able to do all that because because that's the price they paid. They paid that price, so you were able to do that. Mm-hmm. You know what I yeah. mean? But just exactly. but the and fact that you, you you know that and you acknowledge that, and that's all that they're asking. That's all that anyone would want. You know. I think that that's a hundred percent correct. And I, you don't like, we've talked about my friend who was in the military and went to prison hit every Memorial day. He goes out for an hour in the morning and he takes the little stick flags and he starts placing them on the graves for an hour. And that's his ritual for Memorial day. If that's not your ritual, that's fine. But just understand that don't run around on Memorial day and, and just be a jerk and, you know, act like it's spring break it's not there's a meaning to it there's a right. there's a reason for it and and if you're not you don't have to be the guy who who puts the flags out but at least don't be the guy who steps on them exactly right so mr mantania yep. i can't tell you what a pleasure it's been i know we've monopolized a bunch of your time hey this uh, this it, it, it couldn't be for a better group two 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 better guys and for a better reason and for a better kind of a show you know what i mean i do a lot of publicity for lots of crazy things for you know stuff for you know because that's that's my line of work but this is what you're doing is important stuff and so it's a it's a privilege to be part of it and i respect and honor and grateful for what you guys do so it's my 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 pleasure to do it well, I, I appreciate that. And I know well, Chuck's been, uh, Chuck's been very excited. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we thank you. I mean, it, it's, you know, not every day that you have actors who portray a Marine or, or someone in, in, in the correct light or, you know, and, and the roles that you've done. I mean, you've done a phenomenal job. Um, I remember my, my, my father, he's a, he's actually a big fan too. I'm a huge fan. Cause I mean, I love criminal minds. I love CSI. I love all that stuff. And I used to sit there with my dad at night who was also shows a cop. in his little man cave, right. who was also a cop watching. Cause that's sure. how he decompressed. Cause I mean, he's seen a lot of bad, bad stuff and he would decompress <laughs> the cop shows. I mean, and so I'd sit there yeah. with him and, and I remember he pointed out Gary Sinise, uh, he was like, oh, he was a Mar- exactly. he was a marine in, in his backstory, and then I started paying attention to all that, and then I I saw I saw your show, and I, I mean, it's just a big um, we we say thank you. I mean, it's amazing what you guys are doing. I I I just learned that you're on that um, uh, that new direction and um, uh, charity, and I think that's amazing. I can't tell you how many people on the street I've come in contact with that need help, yeah. uh, that are vets that are have sure. fallen down the wrong path, and I think that's Absolutely. a great and amazing thing. I mean, you work for homeboy industries we say thank you for that as police officers because you're out there changing their future changing and reshaping them and teaching them things giving them the skills for things i mean i mean that's amazing uh i want to say thank you my dad wants to say thank you marine corps wants to say <laughs> and thank war you. stories chuck and tom want to say Hurrah, thank you brother amazing <laughs> so and we always Hurrah. sign off um and i'm gonna do it again because i i you know um I just I'm going to dedicate this episode because his his services are this week uh, to my my friend Luca Benedetti. I had to watch May 10th, 2021, San Luis Obispo Police Department. You were a great friend. You were a great trainee. You were a great crop and you will be missed. Uh, So for the rest of our audience, Mr. Mantegna, again, thank you very much. Uh, And I just want to tell the people uh, till our next episode, come home with your shield or on it. (laughs) 